Uh, sir, we are live now. Please start. Okay. Uh, hello, everyone. Namaste. Uh, today, I'm going to share some of my thoughts about uh, how to observe butterflies and in that process help in science. So uh, let me start a little bit with uh, uh, my background first. So as far as I remember, I've been always uh, watching insects and other uh, small uh, critters around me since probably three or four years old. But um, I remember clearly uh, it must be around uh, third or fourth grade when out of outside my window there was a oleander uh, plant and um, it had it used to flower uh, flower once in a while and uh, I used to uh, watch it flowering and uh, sometimes even fruiting and one day I observed a butterfly flittering around it around it for quite some time. And interestingly, there were not many um, uh, flowers on that uh, plant that time. So I was curious what exactly is happening. So I went outside and started observing this particular butterfly. And uh, I realized it was sitting on some tender leaves and curling its abdomen. So, I went closer and looked. So it was actually laying eggs. And this was like a really wow moment for me. I've never seen a butterfly egg, how big it is or how it is. And actually uh, getting to see a butterfly laying an egg. Then I kept observing for next month or so. There were uh, four or five eggs laid on that. And then I managed to find all of them on close inspection. And uh, in like four or five days, the very tiny, small caterpillars emerged out of them. The first thing they did was they ate up the, the shell of the egg, and then they started feeding on the, on the tender leaves. I kept on observing and like, for, for several days, the caterpillars then started growing, they started molting, and a couple of them actually disappeared. So I was a little sad, saying, oh, I had these four or five new friends and one of, a couple of them have disappeared. But then I saw the other ones almost reaching one and a half inch long, and then one day they they just kind of sitting under a leaf in a curl J kind of shape. And I was wondering what's happening with them. And then they turned into a pupa, which was like a uh, semi-transparent um, initially. But then the next day, it literally turned into gold, like gold, like golden pendant, uh, as if it looking like a your gold pendant and then I was I was again so amazed by the, the drastic uh, color change that it underwent and then after a few weeks uh, I unfortunately could not watch it but the, the pupa uh, was open and I don't I didn't see anything so I assume that the butterfly has uh, kind of uh, flown away so you know, that was that was what kind of uh, really attracted me and kind of glued me to watching butterflies and last 40 years i've been uh, watching uh, butterflies uh, when it was time for me to choose my career at one point i was thinking of getting into biology and entomology, that kind of things. But at that point, uh, somehow I also got introduced to computer programming and I really started enjoying that. So for my career, I chose computer science. I did my master's in computer science. Then 
worked for a while and then pursued my PhD in geography, again, getting back to a little bit of biological science. So that that's my background. That's where I'm coming from. And now I'm going to share some of my uh, observations and learnings about butterflies and then touch upon a little bit how just observing and keeping some notes we can help scientists. So that's that's kind of broad outline of my uh, presentation. So uh, let's start with what exactly are butterflies. So butterflies are mm, the, the scientific name for that whole group is Lepidoptera. So that encompasses actually butterflies as well as moths. And the name comes from a, a combination of two terms, lepis, which means scales, and teron means wings. So uh, insect with scaled wings. So what do we mean by scaled wings? So actually, uh, if you uh, see the butterfly wing is a, a, a transparent surface. And then on that, there are a lot of these scales, which are lined up. These scales have different um, uh, colors and different uh, um, refraction indices. So they look very bright, full and colored, but they are just like something like tiles, roof tiles, which are arranged in a uh, in a manner on on the wings of butterflies. So, in the in the childhood or anyone who has tried catching a butterfly with hand and then releasing it, a lot of times we see some kind of color pigments sticking to our hands. Even though the butterfly wing is not really torn, so th those color pigments are actually these really uh, minute um, butterfly scales which are sticking to our hands. So that is what uh, a butterfly, if butterflies and moths are slow, so closely related, what exactly are the differences? So they are actually a very, really, really closely related group. So in some sense, I would say butterflies and moths are artificially divided into two. And then there are a few handful families of Lepidoptera, which are called as butterflies, and then remaining are called as moths, which are uh, really numerous. So the looking at the differences, the main difference that um, to a lot of uh, um, degree we can kind of divide these is the antennae. The antennae for butterflies, it's, it's club-like. And for moths, there are really a, a large variety of antennae. So that's that's one of the main and important difference. Other differences are there, but they are at a broad level, and there are many exceptions for each. So looking at habits of butterflies, mostly the butterflies are day flying, but there are Exceptions, there are some butterflies which are um, uh, which fly either at dawn or at the late evening. Moths are generally night flying, but there are some moths which are uh, day flying. Too. If you look at the, the body, not the wings, the body of the butterfly, typically butterfly bodies are smaller, moth bodies are little uh, bulkier. The scale arrangement in butterflies, it's, it's more compact. In moths, it's more loosely arranged. Uh, looking at colors, we all know that most of the butterflies are more brightly colored and moths are more dark and drab colored. And then the, uh, some of the moths actually have organs that can pursue or catch some certain sound waves, but butterflies, they don't have it. So in, in other words, butterflies don't really hear. They are almost deaf. So these are some of the uh, differences uh, between the butterflies and moths. So as I was just talking, this, this is the shape of the butterfly antenna. It typically has that lobe or the club shape. And in moths, you see so many different varieties of antennae. So there are some 
feather like there are some just string like and mm, all different kinds of shapes so coming to the diversity of butterflies how many butterflies are there so there are about 20000 species of butterflies in the world and india has more than uh, 1200 uh, species there are according to different accounts this number could vary and then there are uh, some new butterflies being uh, described sometimes the same butterfly which is um, Uh, distributed uh, across a long region sometimes scientists find out that the species in india is unique and different than from other places so that's how this number is slightly uh, dynamic but these are kind of rough numbers so the classification of butterflies um butterflies as i was saying there are uh, so many families in the pedoptera so these are the families of butterflies uh, india has uh, uh, six families of butterflies there is only one family which is not present in india so uh, quickly talking about these um, families we have the skippers or hesperids which uh, pretty much uh, in some sense look like moths so they are kind of uh, very difficult to make out if it's a butterfly or a moth they are pretty uh, um, most of them are small and fast flying and um, their their antenna are hooked slightly downwards so uh, uh, they are mostly grass feeders so the caterpillars mostly uh, feed on different kinds of uh, grasses the lycenids which are also called as blues these are also typically smaller butterflies a lot of variety and variation um these are very commonly seen on on the on the grass uh, around us kind of glittering uh, the the smallest butterfly in india is one of the lycenids graduate so they a lot of times uh, towards the end of their um, hind wing they have small antenna like structure and a eye like marking just basically to uh, deceive uh, uh, small birds or other insects the, they will not understand which way is the head is and they are likely to try and catch this particular butter, particular butterfly from the back end and the butterfly has more chances of escaping so that's these are the lycenids or the blues then the nymphalids this is one of the most uh, species uh, diverse uh family they have a interesting thing that they are um uh, so we know butterflies have six, uh, six legs uh, three pairs the the front um, a pair of uh, legs is uh, slightly reduced so uh, they are also called as uh, brush footed butterflies or they look like they have only four leg because they tend to keep the first pair of legs kind of uh, close to their body so these are the nymphalids then uh, papilionids or the swallowtails these are uh, uh, usually large butterflies some of the largest butterflies in the butterfly world are uh, papil papilionids or the swallowtails uh, most of them have a, a extended hind wing or a, they have some kind of tails and uh, Uh, next one is the pyrids they are also called as uh, whites and yellows so these are typically white or yellow orange that kind of colored butterflies um, they are also um, not really grass but most of them are uh, feeding on on the different kinds of bushes or climbers and then the last one is rio Uh, rio dini uh, which is also called as middle marks which is uh, relatively uh, smaller or less uh, diverse uh, family they have a bright metallic uh, spot or shine on their wings and they have a slightly unique style of holding their wings in like uh, not totally flat or close but in like a half open shape so um, 
very very uh, interesting style of setting so these are the important families or classification of the butterflies and why are why are butterflies important why are so many people looking at them or a lot of scientists uh, studying them so one most important thing is aesthetic value mm, people just love butterfly there are very few people who don't really appreciate or enjoy butterflies they have been studied for hundreds of years now they are really beautiful and iconic insects in in some sense uh, there are a lot of references in poetry literature music people like to use them in advertising or illustrations or people release butterflies on on certain occasions so there are so many um reasons why people uh, know and enjoy butterflies a lot of these aesthetic value butterflies are also very important in terms of education because they what we call as a uh, complete metamorphosis that's what they go through so the butterflies they lay eggs caterpillars hatch out of them caterpillars eat 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 and grow uh, some of the caterpillars are known to be growing thousands of times of their original size in that period of 3 mm, 4 weeks that they have or certain pattern caterpillars even like mm, uh, live for a for a year some of them are like overwintering as a as a caterpillar then they get into a, a chrysalis they stay there for a, uh, several days and then uh, in in that process almost the whole body of the caterpillar dissolves and forms into a totally new structure and then they emerge as a beautiful butterfly so very very interesting life cycle Uh, can be easily studied so it has immense educational value that's why a lot of people are looking at or studying butterflies it also has a very good scientific value these are in some sense uh, model organisms for se- several reasons they are sensitive to climate or habitat uh, most of the butterflies are um, kind of feeding on very specific set of plants their their caterpillars so all these things uh, make them very interesting models to study different things and there are a lot of research happening in the field of butterflies people still don't know how they navigate through there are a lot of uh, mimicry related um, aspects i'll touch upon them in a little while they are very uh, they are studied in terms of genetics and evolution uh biodiversity conservation there are a lot of interesting studies happening on that and because they are very uh, sensitive to climate climate change is another important thing where these insects are being studied and if you look at the the insect groups butterflies probably have one of the most comprehensive data sets of course there are huge huge gaps even in in that data but if you just compare the different um insect groups butterflies are one of the one of the best studied uh, organisms ecological value <clears throat> they are very important ecologically because they are part of food chain there are a lot of birds and insects feed on caterpillars or adult butterflies for that matter and then um, they also indicate the health of environment as they are sensitive some um, environmental changes and they tend to disappear or vanish from that area so their presence or absence can tell us um, what is happening ecologically and in in most cases if you see a lot of butterfly species that also indicates there are uh, lot of invertebrate species in that 
region. So in that sense, they are also ecologically important. And I was, as I was saying, they are very important model organisms uh, because of this. Economic value. So there are a lot of indirect values through ecosystem services like um, butterflies do a lot of pollination. Uh, it's not only bees, but a lot of butterflies do uh, pollination and they have um, certain preferences. So a lot of um, a lot of plants depend on butterflies to basically bear fruits and seeds. And ecotourism is also a very important and upcoming field. There are a lot of uh, butterfly tours being organized uh, world over and there are a lot of butterfly watchers who are traveling and keen to visit these places. And then with ecotourism, there are um, butterfly parks developed or taking people to their habitat in the forested area and then there are a lot of related economic activities happening, the transportation, their food, their stay. So uh, that is uh, that is catching up. Even in India, uh, there are a lot of butterfly parks uh, coming up in different parts. Bangalore, Kolkata, uh, Delhi has butterfly parks. There are also wilderness, wilderness areas and habitats being developed, uh, especially for butterflies. And... Um, in, in parts of Meghalaya, I'm aware there are um, mm, local communities who are uh, providing homestay for people who are visiting their region for watching butterflies and the local community has learned about the places where to take people for butterflies and how to identify some basic butterflies and help people learn about them. So ecotourism has economic value and in India, it is a upcoming and picking up field. So these are a lot of these are the things why um, scientists and people are looking at and uh, loving the butterflies, following the uh, butterflies in some sense. So uh, coming to some uh, interesting aspects of butterflies. Uh, a lot of people do not know that butterflies do migrate. It's, a, it's such a small insect with such a, in some sense, feeble body. How do they migrate? Uh, most of us know that butterfly, as a butterfly live, most of the species live only for between two to six or eight weeks. So how can how can such an insect uh, take up migration? But uh, they do take migration, uh, they, they do migrate, and a single butterfly actually flies for uh, thousands of uh, kilometers when they are migrating. So here is a uh, here is a example, a very really well-known example of um, monarch butterflies from North America. A lot of people are aware when, when we talk of butterfly migration, most of the people are aware of this. So what, what happens in case of monarch butterflies is they, uh, in summer, they typically um, breed or uh, live in the Northern uh, United States, uh, Southern Canada, where there are a lot of milkweed plants on which they uh, the caterpillars uh, feed and then they grow. And then what happens is uh, these regions are really, really cold during winters. A lot, most of them are covered with snow, so butterflies uh, cannot leave. So most of the butterflies either hibernate as uh, pupae or some of the caterpillars hibernate underground or things like that. But monarch butterflies have derived a different strategy, they migrate. And for uh, till uh, recent, like till 30, 40 years back, scientists were not aware that they are migrating and they are migrating such a long distance. But 
finally they figured out they go all the way uh, to central mexico and that's where they spend their winter so the butterflies which are born in southern um canada or northern united states or everywhere where there is milkweed in the uh, us and canada they all migrate um uh, to warmer uh, places there are a few of them who go to either florida or southern california but if you look at uh, butterflies on the east side of the of the rocky mountains um they they all kind of funnel and migrate to central mexico central mexico there are these um, uh, forests with um, pines and then that's where they gather they just gather in numbers and they just congregate and they just um, cling to each other and stay together they uh, spend all the cold time there whenever it warms a little bit they start flying uh, they go gather some water not many food resources um, there but they they survive the winter and then in uh, uh, february they again start flying towards north and in um, uh, southern united states where the milkweed starts growing in march they they start laying eggs and most of them they die before they reach central united states but the eggs that they lay within about 6 to 8 weeks the butterflies uh sorry 8 to 12 weeks the butterflies um, emerge out of them and then they they continue their journey towards north and within two or three generations they again uh, go back to the uh, to southern canada and northern united states and they again colonize they breed there and then the cycle continues again late august they start flying towards um south so this is really amazing life cycle and a lot of people know about it but fewer people know about the butterfly migration within it um, dr krishna may kunte in nc base bangalore has been doing some really fantastic research on this um, butterfly migration so the the migration cycle in in india is slightly different <clears throat> so in india butterflies are uh, typically Uh, trying to avoid uh, heavy rains so uh, let's start understanding the migration from western ghats so in western ghats um, the, the the butterflies they are uh, uh, they do uh, have their generations they they lay eggs their caterpillars grow and then the majority of them to avoid the heavy uh, monsoons and the uh, weather in in western ghats in in uh, may june they start migrating towards the eastern ghats and the eastern plains and uh, uh, for that they congregate in big numbers and then they uh, they fly towards that region and then there they go and then they the host plants are available there so they have one or two generations there and then again in the next migratory season when um, september when things start getting more uh, colder and the climate get uh, starts getting rough they again migrate back to western ghats so it's a annual cycle where uh, two distinct generations happen into uh, like a few generations on either side but they happen in two distinct locations so in that sense it's unique it's not like monarchs where they breed in the same location and then they overwinter in another location so it's a it's a very interesting um uh, migration and uh, people uh, living in and around um, 
western ghats uh, might have observed this you will see several butterflies not in a big flock but in like twos and threes following the same direction and sometimes when you you can see like between 30 to 50 butterflies passing through in a minute so you can see them passing through sometimes you see them all gathered together for a night roost and and uh, taking rest or nectaring and then again going further most of these butterfly they they tend to use a little warm weather and uh, slight air currents so they typically start their migration up to 9 or 10 till then they are uh, feeding and kind of refueling themselves so that's that is a uh, that is a fact that many people don't know that there are uh, several species of butterflies in india that do migrate another uh, thing most people think about butterflies is butterflies uh, feed on flower nectar but you actually see a lot of butterflies feeding on various different things not just nectar so i've just taken an example of the same butterfly feeding on different things so this particular butterfly black raja it's it's feeding actually on dung where it gets certain uh, nutrients it feeds on ripe or overripe fruits at times uh, they feed on plant sap like bamboo or some other trees if there is some kind of sap is using uh, i have seen these butterflies visiting that place and getting that sap and they also are attracted sometimes towards uh, sweat because that gives them some kind of salts and some useful nutrients that they they need so uh, not not many people are aware that butterflies do do visit other things than flowers for their food source that's a <clears throat> that's an important um, point to note so you can uh, have some rotten fruits uh, kept somewhere and you can see butterflies visiting or sometimes you see butterflies visiting your pile of manure or things like that that's a, that is the reason uh, the way butterflies feed is uh, through their uh, proboscis so it's very interesting to um, uh, know that it's actually uh, some kind of uh, some kind of capillary but when the butterfly emerges from the from the pupa the the proboscis is actually in two parts and it takes a little while for those two parts to kind of join and connect and there is a lot of interest in research on this topic but uh, in fact even though i have been watching butterflies for so many years uh, i did not uh, know about this fact that when a butterfly emerges it has it has like the um, uh, proboscis into like two parts and then slowly it joins so this illustration basically shows how uh, coiling and opening and it and doing this repeatedly it takes a few minutes uh, and finally the um, butterfly has has like that tubular thing and then the structure of the of the proboscis is also very interesting so it's it's not just a straw because uh, sucking something using a straw takes a lot of energy but it has a very complex uh, capillary structure and it has some kind of uh, um, brushes and missing to kind of uh, sometimes scrape of uh, certain things from flower or from other sources like ripe fruits they want to uh, suck through and then, then they have this uh, kind of uh, small capillary like structure which kind of pushes those liquids that they are uh, mm, uh, they are visiting into their uh mouth so that's that's a very uh, interesting thing to do a little bit of more research if you want to look it up 
butterfly eggs uh, many people don't know that a single butterfly can lay up to 5 600 eggs most of them they uh, lay hundreds of eggs and then some of them they lay them in single or some of them they lay in batches and the, the caterpillars uh, live in in groups in that case so uh, that is an interesting fact to know uh, butterfly males they use uh, certain techniques to prevent Uh, sperm competition so sometimes they overload the female with certain scent so that uh, other males don't get attracted to them but a very interesting uh, thing is this uh, thing called as uh, uh, sparges so what what the male butterfly does is after the after the copulation uh, after the sperms are deposited what they do is they put certain uh, chemical which uh, kind of prevents the female from mating again they are able to lay eggs but they are not able to mate again it's not very commonly seen but in india we do see it in a, a few butterflies and it's a very very interesting um, biological phenomenon that uh, not many people are aware of it. butterfly mimicry is another very very amazing thing again dr krishna mekunte is doing some really good work on this so if you look at these uh, uh, photographs of the butterflies the the top right is the male of the butterfly uh, what we uh, call as common marmot and the left one is the female of the same butterfly uh, in in the second row on the right uh, the second and third row these are the two different butterflies it's not actually common mormon but these are uh, common rose and crimson rose butterflies so common rose and crimson rose butterflies feed on plants which have certain kinds of uh, chemicals and alkaloids which make them uh, nasty tasting or not that nice tasting or palatable for birds so birds would like to avoid the those butterflies when they eat it once they remember and then they avoid so this common mormon which does not possess that kind of um chemicals actually what it does is it has uh, two different forms of their females which mimic these nasty tasting butterflies so that the predators would avoid eating them because they know these uh the the original um, butterfly that they mimic are na- nasty tasting so it's a very interesting phenomenon where the butterflies actually copy the pattern so in this case the the common mormon has these three different forms of females and then they one one of them is like male and two of them they copy totally different butterflies so uh, uh to avoid predation basically and if you are not careful enough you will just think that this particular butterfly is a crimson rose or a common rose so for predators that's um that's how it works so this is a very fresh research right out of uh, press so there these copying also they need to do with a lot of care because if there are more number of good tasting butterflies in this particular lot again there is a problem because then predators have lesser chance of um, coming across a nasty butterfly and they might keep feeding so if the numbers of these um, nice tasting but na- nasty looking butterflies are low then it will be they can survive and then there is a very interesting research about how how this works and as a reason in most cases the males look different because females need to survive more to lay eggs and males can afford to kind of be eaten in the interest of females being able to uh, lay eggs and so in the center is this female of the dinad egg fly butterfly which mimics the plain tiger so plain tiger feeds on uh, milkweed like the monarch so 
they have these nasty um, uh, chemicals and alkaloids. So this particular female mimics that, and then the male does not. So the number of females in any population, they need to be really small compared to the uh, to the plain tiger butterfly. That's the that's the kind of whole survival. <coughs> There are so many other uh, fascinating aspects of butterflies that which I'm sure uh, now that you're interested in butterflies, you will pick up. So I'll quickly touch upon a few aspects of how we can actually contribute to, uh, to science. So citizen contribution, uh, also called as uh, citizen science. So the definition is any scientific research that conducted either whole or in part by amateurs is called a citizen science. So in this case, amateurs are the people who have not really studied, say, biology or ecology, but are trying to uh, contribute to those, those fields. So uh, a physicist or a mechanical engineer or a civil engineer looking at butterflies and contributing something about butterflies is, is citizen science. It's actually a uh, most used and in some sense abused term these days in, in biodiversity science. There is a whole spectrum of uh, kind of involvement uh, level when it comes to um, citizen science. And, and we don't really expect everyone to be become a Lepidoptera scientist, but contribute a little bit while you are you are watching these butterflies. So to looking at what kind of involvements we are talking of. So uh, to my mind, everyone is not really a citizen science. There are a lot of people who are curious uh, biodiversity enthusiasts. I was one of them for quite some time. So people who, who are going out, outdoor people going to look at birds, they come across some interesting butterflies, curious to know, what those butterflies are, though they start posting these uh, butterfly photographs on different social media sites, asking, please ID, what is this? This looks interesting. They start posting it on social networks like Facebook, Twitter, WhatsApp, Telegram, you name it. You see that kind of uh, queries being asked. After a while, they start learning. They know a few names. They become what I call a citizen volunteer. They start becoming a little more serious about looking at butterflies or whatever tax are they looking at. I'm just talking about butterflies here. They start keeping notes saying, oh, I saw this butterfly here, that butterfly there. <clears throat> they learn at least to identify some frequently encountered butterflies and then they start posting more rather than please Heidi. They'll say, is this this butterfly? Is that that butterfly? That's a kind of transition and then they start learning about some of these biodiversity portals like iNaturalist and Biodiversity Atlas where they start posting their photographs and records. And the actual citizen scientist, to my mind, is someone who's really serious to towards contribution. They very regularly collect data on these biodiversity portals. They uh, develop advanced identification uh, techniques, they record their um, observations and they actually become uh, contributors worth uh, as co-authors on some of these uh, natural history um, uh, research papers. So that's how the, the journey of a naturalist to a, a real citizen scientist happens. And I think what we need to have is more and more people into this citizen volunteer category rather than just curious biodiversity enthusiasts so that scientists can build upon what they have been observing. So in, in short, the, the, the enthusiasts are like education and awareness level. The citizen um, volunteers are at data compilation level and then citizen scientists are actually research level who work with the real scientists to, to publish some of these research. So, what, what are uh, scientists looking for from enthusiasts like us? So what typically you know, scientists are looking for is this primary uh, biodiversity records, which are 
simply what so what butterfly have you seen where you have seen the location when have you seen it and who recorded it just a combination of these four which is really really easy to note and if you are taking a photograph you don't even need to know what so you need to note where and when and post a photo someone can help you identify the butterfly and you, you create this uh, primary biodiversity record and once you put this hundreds and millions of records you can look at distribution of a particular butterfly you can look at uh, seasonality you can look at so many many numerous different things so that's how you we start building these uh, uh, primary biodiversity records there are different websites um, uh, which help help us do that uh, one of them is iNaturalist they have a website and an app and a lot of people are posting if you look here there are 4500 people from india who have posted butterflies and there are about 1000 species or taxa documented so far there and there more than 100000 records so iNaturalist is one place where uh, we can put this is a this is a international project run from california uh if you are more into um, this there is also india biodiversity portal which is more make in india product in that sense there are uh, you know, similar features available on india biodiversity portal and again uh, we can post our uh, biodiversity uh, photographs there and uh, the next one is uh, butterflies of india which is part of the uh, biodiversity atlas of india it is again a home grown project the slight difference between the other two and this is this is expert curated so there is a team of experts which look at every photograph that is posted and they curate it and provide ids as opposed to anyone who is interested can provide ids on an actual list and india biodiversity portal this again has more than 100000 butterfly records okay once you start uh, collecting all these how how is that useful so once you have all these data put together as i was saying you can start looking at the spatial patterns you can start looking at the uh, distributional patterns and things like that looking at this so this is how the data then these large numbers of data can be uh, tabulated and we can generate results so all these observations and occurrence record is one of the important part but if you are really keen you can go beyond that you can also uh, start according the early stages how the caterpillars look how the pupa look take photograph observe them share you can record some new larval host plants if you see them the larva of butterfly is feeding on different plants which are not recorded you can uh look at what kind of nectar sources or food sources these butterflies visit what kind of predators depend on that and also if you are serious if you know how to identify butterflies you can start uh, taking systematic counts to look at the abundances of these butterflies so these are some of the next steps that you once uh, start uh, getting into butterflies you can follow if you want to get involved with this more there are the all these butterfly portals that i just mentioned you can go visit them learn from them start posting the photographs that you post or whatever the butterflies you see start going look at them identify there are numerous books available on indian butterflies there are a lot of social media communities on facebook and whatsapp and everywhere you can join some of those communities if you visit the diversityindia.org website you can see a lot of those um, things listed there uh, then there is a big butterfly month being celebrated in the month of september so there is a link in the in the youtube um, uh, at the bottom of the youtube video we have a lot of uh, such uh, talks coming up to explain how to use these portals how to take 30 minute counts just looking at butterflies of different states all these talks are in different languages and uh, specific to different regions 
and participate in nature walks and bio bliss go with other people take photograph and share that is another thing that you can do so in in conclusion what my my whole um, talk was focused upon talking about butterflies they are one of the most fascinating insects they are really really fun to watch i have been watching them last 40 years i still don't get tired i still want to go and go out and watch them every day if possible and while watching some simple observations that we can just record systematically can help a long way for the scientists to understand them better because scientists cannot be there in all place all the time so we can help them learn more and more so this is my point start looking at butterflies and then start taking observations for me unfortunately took a lot of time to understand this second part of keeping systematic records but now there are internet based tools so we all can do it i would like to thank for uh, all the photographs that i used that come from different sources they are not all mine so these are the people from whom people or organizations have taken the photographs from and finally conclusion uh if you have any questions i'm happy to answer now if they are already in the uh, chat box but if you still have questions these are the ways you can reach me out you can reach me out on twitter or email or whatever and I, i'll try to answer some questions but also remember i'm not a butterfly biologist but a citizen scientist thank you do we have any questions Uh, hello sir yes yeah and um, no sir we are not having any question but one guy was asking about your github link if you discuss uh, you can share okay so my github handle also is vijay barve so i will maybe share the link here Yes sir thank you sir you got a feedback also from you. 
प्रकाश ओके Oh, if people are looking for more resources, Butterflies of India is a website where we have a lot of this information available. We have a list of uh, species that are seen in India. And then if you visit some of these pages, you see a <clears throat> set of images available. You can click on distribution maps to see what area are they seen and things like that. So there are a lot of interesting resources uh, available for Indian butterflies. You can also compare different butterflies, look at uh, subtle differences between them. Sometimes to our eyes, they might look just the same. There are very, very subtle differences which distinguish them. So yeah, keep, keep looking for resources, resources and enjoy butterflies. Yes, so uh, butterfly camouflage is a very interesting uh, aspect again. Uh, what happens, like butterflies do use a lot of uh, uh, camouflage uh, techniques where they, uh, they look like uh, something else. So uh, this particular butterfly just look like looks like a dried leaf when it, if it is with the closed wing and when a, a, a bird or something approaches it, it will quickly open it, its wings and flash the blue and then the, the predator will, will get startled and the, the butterfly will get time to kind of uh, quickly fly away or disappear. So that is the uh, that is one of the techniques that a lot of butterflies use. The a lot of caterpillars also use same technique. They just look like a like a dropping of a bird on a leaf initially, so that um, predators don't pay attention to that. They will just think that something has fallen on the on the leaf. So, yeah, very important technique. Thank you for the question, Prakash. Okay, thank you very much for this opportunity and uh, I'm, I'm happy to continue this conversation. Oh, there is... So one more question you got. Yes, yes. So do butterflies uh, spend, uh, spread any disease? I don't think there are any... Uh, any studies or any uh, specific diseases that are being spread by 
butterflies, uh, at least in humans, probably because humans don't interact with butterflies that that frequently very few people really try to go very near or uh, handle butterflies. So that could be the reason. There are certain diseases among butterflies and they need to cope with them. There are some bacterial infections. There are some things that uh, definitely bother them, but uh, nothing that I know of that uh, human beings are uh, concerned or are kind of affected. That was an interesting question, Prakash. Thank you. Yes, sir. Thank you so much, sir, uh, for the session. We can uh, conclude. Thank you so much.